Hello, um, today I'm going to be doing a quick lecture for you guys on narrative therapy case conceptualization. Um, my name is Richard Powell, I'm a licensed therapist, a PhD student here at Oakland University, and I hope this will be useful to you. Narrative therapy is a personal favorite of mine. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, introduce you to our client. You might uh, have seen The Incredibles. It's, uh, Incredibles 2 just came out. This is from Incredibles 1. I'll show you a few clips to introduce you to, uh, to our client. High-speed pursuit between police and armed gunmen is underway traveling northbound on San Pablo Avenue. So Bob is a superhero, right? He's great. He's amazing. But you know what? Superheroes weren't like, um, they were kind of set up to fail in this world. In a stunning turn of events, a superhero is being sued for saving someone who apparently didn't want to be saved. The plaintiff, Oliver Sansweet, who was foiled in his attempted suicide by Mr. Incredible, has filed suit against the famed superhero in Superior Court. Mr. Sansweet didn't ask to be saved. Mr. Sansweet didn't want to be saved. And the injury received from Mr. Incredible's actions, so-called, causes him daily pain. Hey, I saved your life! You didn't save my life, you ruined my death! That's what this Listen, is. My client has no further comment at this time. Five days later, another suit was filed by the victims of the L train accident. Incredibles court losses cost the government millions. And open the floodgates for dozens of superhero lawsuits the world over. It is time for their secret identity to become their only identity. Time for them to join us or go away. Under tremendous public pressure and the crushing financial burden of an ever-mounting series of lawsuits, the government quietly initiated the Superhero Relocation Program. The Supers would be granted amnesty from responsibility for past actions in exchange for the promise to never again resume hero work. Where are they now? They are living among us, average citizens, average heroes, quietly and anonymously continuing to make the world a better place. So, yeah, life isn't great for uh, superheroes. They're forced into hiding by the government. They're um, not, not a preferred group of individuals in society anymore. And we'll see how they adjust to it, or how our client, Bob, is adjusting to it. I thought you'd be back by 11. I said I'd be back later. I assumed you'd be back later. If you came back at all, you'd be back later. Well, I'm back. Okay. Is this rubble? It was just a little workout. Just stay loose. You know how I feel about that, Bob. Darn you, we can't blow cover again. The building was coming down anyway. I what? <sighs> You knocked down a building? It was on fire, structurally unsound. It was coming down anyway. Tell me you haven't been listening to the police scanner again. Look, I performed a public service. You act like that's a bad thing. It is a bad thing, Bob. Uprooting our family again so you can relive the glory days is a very bad thing. Reliving the glory days is better than acting like they didn't happen. Yes. So we see Bob is trying to relive the glory days, right? Even though he's in hiding, he's putting everyone in danger. He can't really adjust to his new situation. Um, you know, it's causing problems between him and his wife, and now we'll see him and his family, how they get along. You're making weird faces again. No, I'm not. You make weird faces, honey. You have to read at the table. Huh? Yeah. Smaller bites, Dash. Yikes. Bob, could you help the carnivore cut his meat? Ow. Dash, you have something you want to tell your father about school? Uh, um, 
Well, we dissected a frog. Dash got sent to the office again. Good, good. No, Bob, that's bad. What? Dash got sent to the office again. What? What for? Nothing. He put a tack on the teacher's chair during class. Nobody saw me. You could barely see it on the tape. They caught you on tape and you still got away with it? Whoa. You must have been booking. How fast do you think you were Bob, going? We are not encouraging this. No, I'm not encouraging. I'm just asking how fast you Honey! were going. Honey! Right. First the car, now I gotta pay to fix the tape. The car? Oh, what happened to the car? Here, I'm getting a new plate. <clears throat> so, how about you, Vi? How was school? Nothing to report. You've hardly touched your food. I'm not hungry for meatloaf. Well, it is leftover night. We have steak, pasta. What are you hungry for? Tony Reidinger. Shut up. <laughs> well, you are. I said shut up, you little insect. Well, she is. Do not shout at the table. Honey? Kids, listen to your mother. She'd eat if we were having Tony Loaf. That's it! Hey! see their family isn't really adjusting to this very well either a lot of conflict at home and Bob is depressed and leaving the family or they're fighting he, he comes back in and, and picks everyone up but yeah so you, you get a kind of sense of the family conflict that um, the situation is causing now we're gonna see um, how Bob's doing at work <laughs> Sit down, Bob. I'm not happy, Bob. Not happy. Ask me why. Okay. Why? Why what? Be specific, Bob. Why are you unhappy? Your customers make me unhappy. What? You've gotten complaints? Complaints I can handle. What I can't handle is your customers' inexplicable knowledge of InsuraCare's inner workings. They're experts! Experts, Bob! Exploiting every loophole, dodging every obstacle! They're penetrating the bureaucracy! Did I do something illegal? No. Are you saying we shouldn't help our customers? The law requires that I answer no. We're supposed to help people. We're supposed to help our people! Starting with our stockholders, Bob! Who's helping them out, huh? You know, Bob, a company is like an enormous clock. Is like an enormous clock. Yes, precisely. It only works if all the little cogs mesh together. Now, a clock needs to be cleaned, well lubricated, and wound tight. The best clocks have jewel movements, cogs that fit, that cooperate by design. <laughs> I'm being metaphorical, Bob. You know what I mean by cooperative cogs? Bob? Bob? Look at me when I'm talking to you, Bob! That man out there, he needs help. Do not change the subject, Bob. We're discussing your He attitude. is getting mugged. Well, let's hope we don't cover him. I'll be right back. Stop right now, or you're fired! Close the door. Get over here now. I'm not happy, Bob. Not happy. He got away. Good thing, too. <laughs> you were this close to losing your... So, um, Bob got fired. Yeah, he assaulted his boss. So, uh, conflicts at work, assaulting his boss, um, conflicts at home family arguments and fights, fights with his spouse. He's trying to relive the glory days and kind of each of these situations. Um, it's kind of why he's absent at the table. He's, he really wants to get away, so he's just gonna try to go back and be a superhero again. Um, and we see that the, the, he has this great setup, but society takes that away with, uh, with criminalizing who he is and his adjustment to that situation is, it, it isn't working out so well right now. So before we get in too much into Bob, uh, let's talk about some concepts we're going to use within the narrative paradigm to understand what's going on. 
Um, and these come from an article by Combs and Friedman. At the very end, I'll give you the uh, citation. It, it's a good, uh, it's a good article to get a g nice overview of of the philosophical basis of narrative therapy. Um, the first thing we want to look at is modern power or dominant discourse, and the power uh, concept is going to come from um, a theorist, uh, M Michel Foucault from France. Um, he's really looked at how power dynamics uh, impact everyone. And, um, and we want to look at power in the context of what's preferred in society versus not preferred. So the privileged few are going to dictate what is good or acceptable. Um, the privileged people are the ones who fit it within whatever stories or dominant discourses are about who is the good or who are, who are the correct types of people. And the rest are going to evaluate their lives against the preferred norms. And the problem with this is, in one way or another, everyone's going to find themselves outside of what's preferred or struggling to fit into what is preferred. And that's going to cause a lot of struggles. And so when I'm talking, you probably should think, well, this is a lot like feminism, and it is. Um, and uh, Narrative and feminism are, are pretty close. Uh, when we look at, but what's a little different is the next conceptualization concept, the narrative metaphor. So we experience our life through stories. Um, and we want to, if someone's telling a thin story about their experience, we know that they're missing. They're missing important details. They're not seeing life for the way it is. Life is complex, and the stories we tell about life should be complex. So the narrative metaphor is life is like a story. Right? So, so that, that's how we're going to see or understand how Bob is experiencing his world. What story has he constructed that gives his story meaning? And, and what, what meaning might he be lacking? So now we're going to look at problems are separate from people. The idea here is the problem is going to exist in the narrative, not in the person. And so we need to look at the relationship the person has with that story, with the, the, the problem-saturated story. We are going to, and this is a concept similar to the Gestalt. We're going to look for the absent but implicit. So what is implied by the person's story but they're not saying? What is the background to the foreground? Okay, someone's really sad and depressed now. What is the background to that depression? What, what was happy there? And that's kind of the key here because when we're trying to do in narrative therapy is construct the alternative story, the alternative narrative that is going to be empowering and, and resourceful and full of strength and thick descriptions of the bad things that include all the all the variances of life that you might be missing out on. So th those are the things that are absent from the stories that people tell you, but are implied that they must exist. So if there is sadness, there was happiness. So you, you can always look for the opposite to maybe pull out the, the implicit from the absent. But that's going to be contextual in, in the story and the experience that people are talking about. And that's, that's an important thing to remember when we're ever we're talking about narrative concepts it's situational, it's positional, it's fluid, so it's hard to come out with like explicit steps and directions. This is how you pull out the absent, um, but implicit. But you, if you listen, if you just stay with people, it'll, it'll come, you'll see it. Um, the fifth pr uh, concept to talk about is personal agency. People are always responding. Um, narrative does not look at people as determined, it looks at people as uh, responsive actors. So there, are, there is a construction that is intentional of the story, and the story is where power resides, the story is where problems reside, and the story is where solutions reside, and stories are created by people, they're created by minds. So there is what happens in reality and outside of people, but we can't ever really know that because the way we make sense of the world is through stories, so let's deal with the stories. And in that context, in that construct, we're looking at people as the creators. It's very constructivist, it's postmodern. Um, and that brings us to the last one, the view of personality. Um, people uh, uh, live in context and their personality arises in context. So Bob might, from that um, 
from those videos we're seeing and i'm kind of jumping the gun here by applying these to bob already so that's okay with this one so because it, it's a little difficult to understand but it's it's not that hard to see so in the first one the first video uh, bob is the hero he is well liked um, his personality is generous and great and what he does kind of fits along with that but as we go along we see bob uh, bob's personality might be characterized completely differently based because of his situation the whole narrative of society has changed and bob's personality has changed with it he goes from being the preferred from being um, great from being generous to being sneaky and destructive and angry and depressed so so that that's kind of the contextual view of personality all right so let's let's start applying to bob so the presenting concerns let's let's look at what we're doing dealing with bob bob is coming into therapy right after he beat up his boss he's lost his job he has that person in low mood anger control problems strained relationships um, and here's a here's a cons so the second paragraph there i am applying the what one of our concepts if we go back to dominant discourse that concept we're applying to Bob and this is how we do case conceptualization within whatever theoretical um, framework you want you need to pull out the concepts the elements of understanding people pull those out and then apply it to facts so let's apply the dominant discourse concept to Bob right now so the dominant discourse is he's that he's trying to live up to being a typical middle class worker with a house, stay at home spouse, and three children. That is the preferred discourse in in America. But this is a deviation from whom he used to be and whom he wants to be. He has a thin description of his current life. So that's the second one, the narrative meta metaphor, right? He's only seen as less than what he, he was used to and not appreciating the complexity and good he can do without being a superhero. So he doesn't have a thick description of his current um, situation. If he really looked hard, there might be a lot he could pull out that would be meaningful and worthwhile and happy in his current existence. He could find meaning maybe in raising his kids, you know, and all the things that we do. But um, but he's not. He's not. He he persists with the thin description, and he persists in um, in a poor fit with the dominant discourse. So he's kind of getting hurt from both ways, his ways of understanding the world and the way the world is and how it views who he is. And so if we want to look at the other conceptualization concepts, I want to go back here and, and uh, just, just take a few seconds to look at these and think about maybe how you would uh, do what I did with the first two, maybe with um, the absent but implicit. What What is kind of absent from um, from the story we've told of Bob but must be there. I've maybe told you a few things like, you know, what's absent is the happiness he could be finding his kids. What's absent is maybe that meaning. Um, or personal agency, maybe. How could Bob's personal agency be, be used as a therapeutic tool here? Um, what's he denying about his personal agency? Those are things to think about. So take a minute, look at those, try to pick one out, and, and see if you can apply it to Bob. Now, if you weren't able to do it or it still feels a little weird, that's fine. Narrative therapy is one of the hardest ones to integrate into your practice and one of the harder ones to understand. Um, but once you get it, it clicks and it, it works well. So be patient with yourself. Um, I kind of cheated by using the easiest ones and then asking you to use the harder ones to apply to Bob. The thick or thin description the analysis of power and dominant discourses versus local discourses. Local discourse isn't on here, but that's the terminology for the stories we tell in ourselves about the world. And how does that, um, how, how does that interact with the dominant discourse? And, and that could be a cause of a lot of distress. So 
So let's look at intersecting factors for a multicultural analysis. So Bob is a white male, and intersecting factors, before I go on, is very important for your dominant discourse analysis. You want, you want to look at all those multicultural pieces, and, and this is kind of the top-down way to use narrative therapy, what is preferred in the society, what, it, what are the in-groups, what are the out-groups, and what out-groups does our client exist in. Um, normally, you're going to find one outgroup for your clients. People are very complicated. There's going to be some way they're not meeting the preferred discourse. So Bob is a white male. He's struggling to conform to the dominant discourse. He has the benefits of privilege. He's white, male, heterosexual, middle class, but he's struggling to function. He's lost his job, putting his family at risk of poverty. He has physical traits. So right now we're getting outside of the, the dominant discourse, right? His he requires a lot of effort on his part to control and hide his physical traits, or he can harm others and be treated as an outcast. He does not fit into society without hiding who he is, and his abilities have been the subject of the legal institution's control. So in this way, we can see parallels to Bob's situation, maybe people in the LGBTQ community. He belongs to an insular minority that lack power and access to the political system. So they're not represented. There's not a lot of them. They, they can't like get their representative into the Senate. Um, they're at the mercy of the public in general over um, characteristics they have that they have no control over. So, and let's talk about why we're going to use narrative therapy with Bob. Um, first of all, we're going to use narrative therapy with Bob and um, because we're going to look at his uh, societal problems and his efforts to adjust or, or fit in as, as an oppressed minority. Um, but beyond that, it looks like he's dealing with a lot of uh, depressive symptoms and uh, narrative therapy has been shown to to uh, decrease depression by increasing hope and and that's a, that's an important part of uh, narrative therapy because the alternative story and and this can work really well with depressive clients depressive clients are are good at creating thin depressing narratives about their life we work to thicken the description work to help them engage them in a collaborative process to create a hope-filled discourse and, and that, that tends to work really well especially in my experience um, let's talk about the counseling relationship with a narrative therapy the role of the client is very active um, they're the author they're the expert on their existence and their life and their experience and their job is to develop the thick descriptions um, to externalize action as their co-author along with the counselor and act as the expert, like I said. The therapist is, um, is also very active, so narrative therapy should look pretty active. The therapist might be self-disclosing a lot. You want to deposition yourself as the expert on the client's experience, but you do want to remain um, in control of the process. You're, you're working as a co-editor of the client's story the editor's job is very important you, you your job is to guide the client in, in a way by using a lot of questions and, and we'll get into that but but uh, the questions are directed so narrative therapy at the same time the client is positioned as the expert but the therapist is also directing it so it's it's a little paradoxical and it can be a little uncomfortable especially as a new therapist to to get down but like I said, once it clicks, it clicks, and, and it's hard to stop doing. Um, so with Bob, let's say I'm working with him, I'm going to take that collaborative approach that's so important to any postmodern approach, whether it is feminism or, or uh, narrative therapy, or uh, there's even an approach called collaborative. Um, so we want to start with his narrative. We want to respectfully help him tell his story and look for points that the description is thin, Look for the absent but implicit. Um, ask questions to help Bob explore it. And, and that's how you intervene in narrative therapy. You use questions to allow them to be in the driver's seat about how their story gets thickened. You don't say, well, you're missing this. You say, well, what about this? Is that important? That, that's kind of, that's, that's the difference. You, you don't tell them, you ask. And then, and then you respectfully let them be the decider. And, you and that's a very facilitative role. And you help him introduce those internal characters himself and external forces as characters, and you thicken the description, and, and it becomes more interesting 
um, story that hopefully brings out themes of resourcefulness and strength and empowerment and meaning and and all those things that will help Bob adjust to his world without without causing more harm. Um, while I'm working with Bob, I might it might be difficult for me to develop empathy with him because he uses violence. I may fear for my own safety. I mean, he he just beat up his boss. Um, and when you are collaborative, you do have to be a little bit brave. So them and a little confrontive. So that might be part of part of a struggle with working with him. But I would overcome that by being genuine and congruent. So I'm bringing a little bit of person centered in there and communicate my fear to him. And, and that's an important part of being a therapist in a narrative setting is, is that self-disclosure of, hey, you know, I'm fearful right now. We're not trying to act as a blank slate. We're not really trying to bring out transference. We're, we're not trying to do that. Um, we're, we're trying to get them to see us as people and, we, and to help them see themselves as people. It, it's supposed to be a demystification of therapy. So our treatment goals, um, these are just goals I brought up. Um, you might have different goals, that's fine. Narrative therapy is very flexible like that. And uh, Bob really should be setting these on his own. And if I set these goals, I would definitely check in. Hey, you know, Bob, I, I'd like to increase your sense of re agency, meaning like choice, so that with uh, in these situations, you, you might feel like you have a lot more options than responding with anger. You know, and I'd, I'd, I'd state it just like that to see how he would take it. Um, we want to increase the frequency of fun with his spouse that supports his preferred reality to reduce his experience of depression. Um, and I would get this out of him, like, hey, Bob, how did you used to interact with your spouse that, was, that, that you liked? And, and he might talk about all the fun times he had with her when they were both superheroes. And so we, we might see how we could recreate that in the present. Um, and and that's, that's a narrative part that I didn't really talk on here, but it's a common technique in narrative is to pull out those little shining moments from the past to see how, what was working well back then. And what, you know, and you use that a lot of times when clients are stuck, like I'm stuck, I don't know what to do. And you say, well, when was the last time you were struggling with something similar to this? And how did you respond? What worked for you well back, you, work, worked well back then? And that's a very solution-focused technique, but solution-focused also fits in the same postmodern paradigm, so it's okay to borrow stuff from that. And solution-focused also uses a lot of questions as, as interventions, so, um, so it's, feel free to borrow from solution-focused as much as you want, um, as, as long as we're using it in the narrative framework to increase and thicken the plot. Um, we're always trying to thicken that plot with with those themes of resourcefulness and, and strength and empowerment. So we want to um, help him create that sense of identity that's meaningful to him and, and help him adjust to his, his new reality to reduce that anger, depression, that increases gratitude and sense of purpose. Um, and that ends right there with a the question. Anything else? If you have another goal that you thought of as you were watching or as I was talking, or if you didn't like the goals that I wrote down here, um, that's fine. You can always think of something else. That, that's what's great about narrative. It's very creative. Always create something new. So narratives you have helped be functioning. So we're not going to dictate to the clients what healthy should look like in their world. We're going to let them discover that or create that or tell us what's important for them to be healthy. Um, and, and that's really what I'd look like. I'd be like, Bob, what? What's it going to look like when, when we're done here? How, how do you want to feel about yourself in the world? And he might say, I don't know. And I say, well, that, that's fine. We'll, we'll get there. Um, and that, that, that's an important part of this. We're not going to dictate to them, this is what healthy looks like. But on the other hand, there might be some things in postmodernism that will clue you into that. Are they telling a thick description? Are they... Are they hyper-focused on all the negative, or is there a mixture of the positive? Do they have hope, or, or are they giving in to despair? Things like that um, might clue you into the healthy story. The, and also we want to look at, is the, is the story problem-saturated? Um, normally, clients are coming in with a problem-saturated story. 
a clue that the client has reached healthy functioning, well, we're not going to dictate what behaviors and thoughts or anything that that might look like. If the story they're telling about their current life and situation and hopes for the future and the past is still dominated by problems, it's still problem saturated, um, we're, we're probably not there yet. So techniques have kind of given this way a little bit. We're going to use a lot of questions. The questions aren't meant for us to gather information. They're meant to create an experience in the client, uh, an experience where they're gaining insight. Um, the questions we're going to use intentionally. Um, and But beyond that, right, beyond that, we want to help the client find their meaning with the questions. Um, the literal question right there, what was your intent? That's getting beyond, it's getting deeper um, from the action. Um, another thing that you might say is, what is the fear behind that anxiety? Or, you know, you have depression, what, what have you lost? What is sad? And, and you see how I'm kind of listening for the implicit, but, but absent, or the absent but implicit. It's okay if you switch that around it, just mean it still works. Um, we're gonna use questions asked for permission. Uh, remember, the client is the expert. The client is is um, on their own life. So you, it, before you do something, before you proceed down a path, before you ask the client to um, develop a story in a certain way, because narrative is directive, it's important to ask for permission before going for that. Um, questions. So scaffolding is, is an idea from, uh, from cognitive development that is a big part of narrative therapy. You're going to use scaffolding to help the client see new ways of, of addressing a problem. So you're going to model for them through your questions different ways to think about things. I think that's the easiest way to describe that. So you can say, well, you know, when, when uh, I hear your story, sometimes I think about it from this angle. Um, does that angle make sense to you? And, and maybe how, how would you look at it differently? You know, something like that to, to kind of model for them and then ask them to, to riff off of what you just did. Um, externalizing is a big part of narrative therapy. And that, that's, that comes from that concept that the person is separate from the problem. Um, if the client is seeing the problem as themselves, you want to externalize that. And you can do that slowly by saying, now what part of you is saying that, you know? And then what, what would you name that part? Sometimes that, that's a kind of a sneaky way to do that. Um, but you want to talk about the problem as if it's its own, um, if, it's, if it's, it has its own identity and to draw out the relationship that the client has with the problem, how the problem has affected the client throughout the years. That's called uh, mapping the influence of the problem. Um, and, and you do that to, so that they don't feel so hopeless. The more ex you externalize the problem, the greater the hope, the greater the strength, the greater the, um, the agency the client is going to feel. And increasing agency is, is a wonderful goal of, well, it's not really the end goal of therapy, but it's, it's one of the techniques we use to help people get to where they want to be. Well, listen for their preferred story, and that'll be in the background. And the preferred story is, a, I've been calling it the alternative story, the alternative narrative. And th that is what stands out in um, contrast to the problem-saturated story. A depressed person is going to come with a problem-saturated story. They might not, um, you know, uh, it's, it's called a, the preferred story here. And that's coming from Combs and Friedman. Um, the reason why I call it the alternative story is because the client, it might not be the client's preferred story at the beginning, but it might be, so if you're calling it the alternative story, that might be enough to um, draw in their interest in developing it. So like, okay, this is your current story, and it makes a lot of sense. I see where you're coming from. Um, you know, using different um, events and things that you've told me about, I, I'm also seeing a, a theme of this. And and maybe that's an alternative way to look at it. When you state it that way, when you call it the alternative story, you can enlist their help in developing it a little easier. Um, problem deconstruction is an important part. And, and the word deconstruction there is we're going to take the points, the problem points, or the name of the problem. Okay, you're calling it depression. Um, what, what are the parts of that depression? What, what are the different 
elements that are going into it. What is your experience of depression like? And we can pull out different parts of it and really break it down into different things. So it's not one construct, but it is now many different little constructs. And that's going to help the client see different ways he's he or she has dealt with different parts of the problem and it's going to make the story a lot more interesting and it's an important part of thickening the narrative um, in the situating comments that goes along with the roles of the client and the therapist you're going to make a lot of situating comments to refuse that position of expert on the client's experience in the client's life um, the idea is if you are positioning yourself as the expert you are harming the client by removing their agency and you're also harming them by creating the dominant narrative of what that client should be. And that, that's oppressive. And that goes back to Michelle Foucault's uh, dominant power. Um, if you as a therapist are exerting power over the client, you're harming them. So it's really important to situate yourself as not the expert. Maybe you can stay as the expert as a process and, and a very important guide. So it's, it's a hard, hard thing to do. It's, it's a tight line to walk. It's a tight rope. It's a thin line. Anyway, so all these techniques are part of the, any, anything you do as you listen. It, it's kind of intense. It's, it's exhausting, but normally it's very meaningful for the client. And, and, and it's, it's a new experience for the client when you do it right. They tend to really like it. And I think Bob would love this. And, um, and here's my references. So I encourage you to look up that Combs and Friedman article. It's a great introduction. Um, the textbook is great too. There's some books on Amazon you might like. Uh, I encourage you just to go to Amazon Prime, type in narrative therapy, read through the things and find what looks good to you. Um, right now, I, I think you guys are the experts on your own experience and, and what kind of books speak to you and I want to privilege your experience of that and and let you be the experts in your experience but gently guide you and say I think that's a I, for me personally it's been useful and I'll ask you the question what what do you think would be useful to you to read and by encourage more reading on narrative therapy I think uh, at the very least some of the question skills um, and unique uh, techniques to narrative therapy can help thicken any any approach so thank you for listening and i wish you all the best of luck goodbye